Um, Fritz, thank you so much for joining Design Driven. Uh, I'll give a quick introduction and then we can jump into the fireside chat. Um, Fritz is the CEO of ClassPass. Previously, he served as an executive at Microsoft, which we'll touch on in our chat. He's a serial entrepreneur, investor, uh, founder, having started and grown three venture-backed companies, including Livestar, Burst, and Doppler Labs. Fritz is also a seed investor whose portfolio includes Square, Pinterest, sounds familiar, Wish, Flexport, Form Labs, and, and many, many more. Um, Fritz, welcome to Design Driven. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. So I'd love to start by rewinding the clock a bit. I was doing some uh, research and I realized that your first position at Microsoft was product manager. I'd love to just hear what initially intrigued you about the world of tech? Why specifically product as a first foray? Was it an accident? Was it intentional? And would you mind orienting the audience a bit on how large Microsoft was um, at, at the time you joined? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's been longer than I'd like to admit uh, since I made the decision. <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to think that I had some grand plan, but, you know, like most of us, I was, you know, 20 year old uh, college senior, just turned 21, trying to decide what to do. I went to Yale and on campus, there was consulting firms and banks. This is now, I graduated in 2003. So um, uh, it was a tough time to be thinking about going into tech because there'd been a lot of excitement with the bubble and then things had gone really sideways. So everyone I knew was trying to get to Wall Street at the time. Uh, and um, I interviewed at some of those places. I didn't really know what investment banking was, but I thought it'd be fun to make a lot of money and learn. And I, I was quite quantitative, so I thought that would be kind of a good fit. It was really hard to get a job doing that. And uh, a friend came and said, hey, Microsoft is starting its first uh, undergrad hiring program for non-engineering uh, type roles. And it was right after Bomber had taken over for Gates. And I honestly didn't know much about what the job was going to be other than I had always been really into software and from Silicon Valley and um, the whole kind of, you know, the, the Steve Jobs, the computer is a bicycle for the mind thing felt to me like a sort of mega trend that would, you know, uh, would, would be sustained over the course of my life and career. And so yeah, I always felt like maybe I'd have a gravitational pull back to Silicon Valley. I didn't think it would go to Seattle, but it's hard for younger folks to understand how big of a deal Microsoft was at the time. Like Google was just a right. startup. Microsoft was like, you know, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft combined. It was the big player. Right. So I interviewed, I wasn't really qualified for the job. I got into the program. I got an offer to be a product manager in the server and tools division um, and had to quickly learn, you know, what a server was uh, and how Microsoft's business lines even worked. And fortunately, the program was awesome. I got to meet tons of great entrepreneurs, uh, uh, you know, who are eventual entrepreneurs through, through this program, 35 of us, lots of resources, lots of training and, and a day job, which came with a lot of, uh, of training and resources. So, um, so the, you know, the honest answer is I, I didn't sort of choose product and Microsoft product manager is actually like a marketing and product role. Um, gotcha. So it was a really good, just kind of education. Um, and, but, you know, if I'm being totally candid, I, I got lucky. It wasn't some grand plan. Okay. You were, you were in product before product was cool is what, is what you're telling me. I, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and then as you rose through the ranks of Microsoft, you transitioned more to the corporate investment team um, and you played a role in their investment in Facebook uh, in 2007. You want to just share a little bit about kind of how you moved onto that team and, and what that looked like? Yeah, so I got introduced. Uh, I'd done my stint in this training program. I'd done well in the program. I was at the top of the class. So I had lots of job offers for my next rotation, you know, my next thing after kind of 18 months. But um, I actually was interviewing at Google and some executives found out and they said, you know, we should offer this guy something to stay, give him something special to do. Uh, and I was dating uh, somebody who, um, you know, couldn't, didn't want to come to Seattle um, that I'd met in Italy as an undergrad. So I said, hey, would you guys let me, if I stay, will you let me move to Europe? And they said, yeah, you can go to London. And, and we actually have a team wow. doing internet strategy that uh, this guy, Charlie Songhurst and a woman named Krista Davies, um, who's now the CFO of Aon, um, they're starting this upstart team, not the traditional corporate strategy group, just focused on kind of consumer internet. You want to go to London yeah. and try that? And I did. And really the first paper that that team, those guys produced was, uh, and, and gals produced was about Google and the threat Google would represent to Microsoft's core franchises wow, and okay. ad funded free software and the attack that they would lay. 
And so we sort of got to be at the forefront of getting Gates and Bomber really focused and zeroed in on that threat. Uh, it sort of triggered a lot of the investment in the online services division, the acquisition of Aquaniv, uh, and then the deal we did with Yahoo, which was several different dalliances and ended in a big search partnership. You know, Bing's now like, I don't know, a billion dollar free cash flow business for Microsoft. It's, it's not bad. It's not, yeah. not where we wanted it market share wise, but it's a big business. And, uh, and, and then Facebook came around. And so we were doing internet strategy and our, our remit was growing. We then worked for Kevin Johnson, who's now the CEO of Starbucks. He ran the platform services division, online windows and advertising. And we kind of kept being strategy advisors to the next successive executive until we eventually yeah. uh, got the job doing corporate strategy for the whole company. And gotcha. um, I can't remember if the Facebook deal, we looked at buying it when Yahoo almost bought it and thought it was too rich. And then I was able to convince uh, Steve and Bill and, and a bunch of the Microsoft leadership, Kevin Johnson, along with a guy named Hank Beal, we were able to convince them to make a run at it. And um, uh, it was funny because Zuckerberg's lieutenants were sort of signaling that we could buy the business. And that's what I had yeah. sort of presented to the board. Uh, but when Mark met Steve, uh, he was like, I don't want to sell, um, but I'll uh, let you invest a quarter billion. And luckily, Steve made the decision to do bad. that. Yeah, yeah, I like to joke that that was the... Uh, the best corporate adventure investment in history and worst GP remuneration in history. Um, I got a nice you know, stock award bonus, but nothing like uh, yeah. carry on whatever it was, 10, yeah. 10 or 12 billion of, of return. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Um, awesome. And I, well, just before we jump into class pass, cause I know there's a lot of stuff to talk about there. Um, I'd love to just quickly touch on, so you, you actually have found it yourself. You'd started a couple companies between Microsoft and class pass, one of which was live star, which you actually sold to Pinterest. Do you want to just share kind of the Cliff Notes version of the Livestar story and maybe one or two lessons you learned in the in the sale to Pinterest? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I sort of had a panic attack. I woke up, I'd done really well at Microsoft. I did the Facebook deal. I became a director at a young age. I had a lot of remit and it was a super fun job getting to sort of advise, you know, senior executives and have a front row seat on how a behemoth would navigate sort of a traditional innovator's dilemma, business model disruption, working with folks like Satya Nadella is now the CEO. And um, it was so fun, but I woke up and I was like, oh man, I, I'm 29. Uh, and I had just seen what entrepreneurship looked like up close with Facebook. So I sort of had a panic, uh, mid early midlife crisis and said, I need to leave and become an entrepreneur. Uh, it helped because I had started angel investing. As you said, my first check was just dumb luck with Square. Third check was Pinterest, gone to Yale with those guys. Fifth was Wish. Yep. I was like, this isn't that hard. I don't know what my VC friends are saying. And now... <laughs> I'm reverting to the mean right. a little bit after a hundred bets, but um, <laughs> yeah. So that made me even more excited about trying my hand to be a builder. You know, just watching from the sidelines was something I just, I, it was fun and it was looking like it would be profitable. But I decided that ultimately, if I did want to be an investor full time uh, or a seasoned kind of big company executive, the best business school that I could have would be going to try to start something. So the first business right. I did was Livestar. And I spent uh, about two and a half years there, classic startup, tons of first, first founder mistakes, um, you know, ranging from having an overly ambitious plan. I wanted to build a platform business, a machine learning recommendations platform and thought, oh, okay, yeah. I'll build my own killer app first to so sort of being too big and not sort of narrow enough, uh, not learning, not listening to customers enough, um, over engineering a bit. We, we spent a lot more time than we should have sort of just getting something out there that users could play with. Uh, yeah. and tons of lessons about fundraising, you know, and the good and the bad. And um, luckily we built really good technology and, and had a great team by the end. And so the consumer app didn't quite take off like we'd hoped, but we had some options, was able to sell to Pinterest, um, you know, back when Pinterest, I think it was at a, when it was 1.5 billion valuation. So we were sort of betting on Pinterest appreciation. They didn't bid as much as some of the yep. traditional acquirers were. And I didn't have to join full-time. I already owned equity in Pinterest. I was really close to the founder. They didn't really have a job for me. And so I was just, you know, an advisor and, and a friend and my team landed there and it was a great outcome, but it wasn't without, you know, sleepless nights. I think the biggest lesson and sort of, well, one lesson is it's really hard to sell a business. A lot of startups get acquired, yeah. you know, by the numbers. But if you think about the denominator of how many don't get acquired, you don't hear those stories and right. that ratio, it's just not, it's not a guaranteed thing that if it fails, you're going to be able to find some place to park the company and get everyone a great return. Right. So that was one lesson was just how hard it looks easy from the outside, but how hard it actually was to even just have a successful exit, even with, you know, differentiated tech and team. 
The second lesson was uh, I raised money from a who's who of the best, most supportive, smartest, great angel investors, great brand. Right. And it was kind of a party round thing. But I will never forget the trauma of transitioning out of the bosom of Microsoft and the safety of Microsoft, mm. especially after the financial crisis, where I was making right. a lot of money, more money than, you know, my dad is a doctor, like more money than I ever thought I'd make to, okay, I, I had some savings, but I downsized my house to a, a little apartment with my then girlfriend, now wife, God bless her, you know, got rid of my BMW lease, like, and to, to dig in here. But the worst part about the whole process was when people said yes to my fundraising pitch and wired me the money. Right. I didn't sleep for a week after raising my first, you know, million and a half dollars. It, the, the, the burden of being a steward of their capital and mm -hmm. the fact that 90% chances would, uh, that I would fail, I wasn't prepared emotionally, but becoming yeah. an entrepreneur made me so much sharper. I, I, it was like, I came in touch with senses like smells and instincts that were in me that I wasn't aware of when I was in the bosom of safety of Microsoft. So right, right, it was right. traumatic. It was a traumatic uh, evolution, but it, it really was the most profound um, professional development experience in my life. Going off on my own, having people who I trust, respect, and love give me their money and say, hey, we yep. trust you to go do something with this. And then um, it just, it made me sharper. It made me more alert and made me realize how safe and how plush it had been at like summer camp, which was, you know, inside the bosom of the big company. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Um, all right. Well, let's dive into class pass. Cause it's actually, there's a nice segue there in, in the fact that you were introduced to the company as an investor originally, and then joined um, now obviously as CEO, um, you know, you shared a little bit about how that transition occurred, why you were convinced by Pial to, kind of take the jump and, and, you know, lead the company and um, just share with the audience. Yeah. Pyle has, uh, you know, if you haven't had her on, you should, she's incredibly charismatic and compelling. And, you know, she had me say yes to the fundraising pitch within 10 minutes of meeting her. So I'd left Seattle after selling Livestar. I'd started a few companies, a bionic hearing business, a publishing AI business, and ClassFast became kind of the third adopted, adopted uh, project. And I led the seed round when it was pivoting into class fast. She came to me, we met, and in 10 minutes, I was like, this market is desperate for aggregation. The subscription yep. model is way friendlier for suppliers because they could hide the pricing behind a paywall. Um, it just made sense, you know, and, and the, the, the wellness industry and the secular trends behind millennials and, and younger people spending money on experiences instead of, you know, other things, material things and, and health and wellness in general is just another mega trend in our lifetime, and I hope. And so... I was in on investing. Then it came time to her A round. She had six or seven term sheets. Um, I had become a really close advisor. I'd set the fundraising process up for her because I'd helped Ben raise a bunch of Pinterest yep. and others. And, um, you know, she just, she was like, this is really superficial. I'm going to take money from someone and have a 10 year partnership with them. And I've met them like three times, like the initial pitch with them, right. the follow up with them and a few partners, then the partner meeting. And like, I've had a few calls and maybe a dinner. It just, you don't know, you, you know, it's, it's such a, it's, it's like for speed dating into a marriage. And, yeah. um, and so she was really like, God, I'd love to find a way for you to get on the board. Some of the VCs said, Hey, you could take the seat for us, Fritz. We know how close you guys are. And, um, but I ultimately decided I, I co-invested and led the A along with CRV. Um, but my, my investment partner, Hank Beal and I actually, you know, we raised an SPV to put money in and lead it so I could become the exec chair. So then I was yeah. exec chair and for about a year, it was great. I was Pyle's coach. Um, I got to be, you know, tell her how to do it, not have to do it myself. And <laughs> what I saw over yeah. that year was two things. You know, one was the business changed. It was growing like nuts, uh, like crazy. We had launched an unlimited workouts promotion that we sort of kept on and got stuck in a pricing war with clones. So we had to kind of keep it on. That became the business model. Mm. So yeah. what happened was two things. You know, the company is growing gangbusters uh, from a revenue and user standpoint and a profile standpoint. But it was also growing gangbusters from an employee standpoint. You know, Pyle went from three or four years with her and two partners to then in one year growing from kind of six to like 100 employees and spending, yeah. you know, 0% of her time on products, you know, le less and less time on product, less and less time on marketing and more times on operations and HR and finance. And she just didn't like the job. And it, we had some bad business model challenges. We had to say, hey, are we, how are we going to get off this unlimited thing, get out of it? Yeah. And, uh, 
you know, for about three months, we were just talking about it, talking about it. She convinced me, hey, give me a year. Come co-run the business with me. So we didn't change titles, uh, but she convinced me to kind of step in. And over the course of that year, uh, it just, our roles have naturally evolved. I, I'm more of an operator and, and an entrepreneur and I like it. And I like the nitty gritty stuff and I like the hard parts of it. And she wanted to focus on, um, you know, the more aspirational parts, the marketing, you know, the, the product vision and direction. And so at the end of that year, the roles had just naturally evolved. And the, the, the title change was, was basically just a, a formality at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was really cool. Like a lot of founders have this big chip on their shoulder about needing to be the CEO and needing to prove it. She was just like, I don't love it. Like, right, I don't right, love right. the job and I'm miserable. And, uh, you know, but you're the only person I trust. So she kind of held me hostage to jump in and help her. And then I fell in love with it. Here I am, you know, six, yeah. six years later having run the business. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty impressive self-awareness and, and also, yeah, just kind of putting your ego aside and say, let me, let me bring Fritz in, in a, in a more in, intense um, capacity and, and obviously you still have, you know, hands on the business and, and that sort of thing. Um, I want to be conscious of time. I want to get to audience questions, but I'd love to just chat uh, through a couple of things. Um, COVID obviously has uh, hit us over the last year, year and a half um, at ClassPass. I actually uh, just curious how you've led through COVID. And you actually had an um, interesting comment in one of the, your previous talks around anti, learning from anti-lessons. Can you explain like what, what an anti-lesson is and um, how you guys were maybe able to move a little bit faster than most other businesses when COVID started to, started to hit? Yeah. So I'm like not naturally a, 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 a person who likes conflict or hard conversations. I'm kind of a people pleaser. I was raised to be polite, uh, but I've had to sort of deprogram myself in my career and have, you know, when you have to have a hard conversation with someone or terminate someone or yep. give the board bad news or the company's failing and, or your investors, you've lost the money. I mean, it's better to just get those conversations out of the way. And I've actually like Pavlovian conditioned myself to, when I'm having a feeling of, Ooh, I don't like that. I don't want to have that combo. Yeah. Just go run right at it. And right. the best part of embracing that um, was in COVID when COVID started to roll in started in our Asia businesses. We're in China and Southeast Asia. So we had good foresight that it was spreading at a, you know, exponential rate and was not easily right. containable. We probably got overconfident about the containment because of the success that they had in, in many Asian countries kind of containing it. Um, you know, Japan has, you know, basically COVID hasn't existed. They, they don't even have the vaccines rolled out and life is going on perfectly as normal there or, or in China, they had harsh lockdowns, but then got out of it or Southeast Asia. So it, it then came in. And when we realized it's, it was like, there's cases in Seattle. And when that happened, it was like, okay, this is bad. We're going to have layoffs right. here. You know, it, within a, a matter of days, 95% of our industry, of our partners were government mandated to shut down. You know, uh, and so we had a choice to make, you know, one was I could put a bunch of, uh, you know, a pretty face on it and try to beat around how devastating this could be. The other was just to be really honest with the team and yeah. to say, this is going to be really tough. And uh, the anti lessons came from, you know, observing conflict avoidance and the toxicity that's bred. Um, or when you have to do a layoff, like death by a thousand paper cuts, the worst thing you can do yeah. for morale is have to make a lot of decisions or just being slow. Like when it's obvious to everyone in the world, like right. there's a freaking global pandemic going on and right. we're in the fitness business and like, that's tough. You know, yes, we scrambled to get uh, online live stream workouts up and we, we've, you know, did stuff to help our partners. We foreran our revenue commissions on those, but we decided to act transparently and very swiftly and aggressively. And yeah. then when we actually had to make some, some changes on, you know, personnel side, we were trying to do it generously and to, to do it aggressively enough that we wouldn't have to do it again. And so, you know, I found that my employees, they understood, you know, I personally was laying people off and I was in tears addressing the company after yeah. that's okay yeah. to be a vulnerable leader and to talk about it. The people were great though, because they understood it was an objective event, an exogenous right. event. It wasn't any fault of their own. That made it a little easier. And they appreciated that we were honest about it and that I was honest with the company about the problems. And at that juncture, everyone in the company had a decision to make. Do they go work for a different company that is protected from the pandemic or going to have tailwinds from it or whatever? Or do you stay and do you roll up your sleeves and say, if I can get through running a fitness company through a global pandemic, I can right. do anything the rest of my career, right? And I turned right. everyone in the company into a problem solver and, and said, here's the problems. Can we figure it out together instead of I've got the secret plan or I'm going to go away for 100 days and come back with a plan? It was, guys, this is a pretty messy situation. 
here's what I think we're going to do. Luckily, we had just raised a big round, but I'm really looking to you all to kind of help come up with ideas and how we're going to get through it. And it worked. Yeah, I was going to actually, I was going to ask Let's about culture, but it sounds like that, it sounds like that is the culture at ClassPass. It's just like that can do attitude. Like, let's turn a negative into a positive. Let's push through it. We're going to be stronger for it. Um, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, and I, I think it's sort of intentional and unintentional. We've happened, I, that's my personality. Is like, as, right. as my comms team, you know, Mandy will tell you, like, she can't control <laughs> what I am or not going to say. People get nervous <laughs> putting me out on, on public forums. I am who I am, but also we've we've recruited a comp- an employee who is, you know, entrepreneurial, and yeah. is a believer in this mission, and is here for more than just passing a quick buck, you know. And um, that's that really saved our bacon in that in that moment because our employees didn't want to be fed a line; they wanted to know what are the yeah. problems and how can I help. So, yeah. Maybe my last question before we jump into, I have a bunch more, but I want to give the audience some time. So audience, make sure you're asking your questions in the Q&A portal and I'll, I'll keep going. Um, but one other one that you touched on, I thought was super fascinating from another talk that you gave was, um, you know, that the other talk you talked a little bit about connected fitness and how it's not really competitive with ClassPass because actually as solopreneurs become more prevalent, um, there's this concept around uh, them using ClassPass to build their own audiences with these other tools. Um, would you want to just like unpack that a little bit and, and how you view class pass and maybe the broader fitness ecosystem moving forward? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I think connected fitness is amazing. I'm, I, I have some connected fitness products. It's just, it actually is more just that that's a different business. Like right. digital fitness is here to stay. The world is going to be multimodal. There's three customers. Some customers want to only do digital. But they tend to be the people who are willing to pay tend to be connected to right. consumers, Peloton or Tempo or Fight Camp or Hydro. The other extreme is those who just want to be in person, right? Those are yeah. our partners, direct customers at gyms or studios or spas or our customers. Then there's the middle, the people who want to do both and be multimodal. What we've found is our customers are mostly more on the left. They really value that immersiveness, the coaching and instructor feedback and accountability in the sense of community. And yep. you can't replicate, you certainly you can't do like Pilates at home, right? Like it's a hard machine to have around. Right. <laughs> so, um, so I just think they're kind of different markets, but I think for that hybrid group in the middle where we do have some of those customers, it's been great being able to say to them, okay, now we've got a lot of our instructor community and studio community and, and gym personal trainers, adopting these digital tools and they can use class yep. pass just like they do to track demand, just like they do for their offline workouts. So I think that feature is here to stay. I'm not sure how great of a business non-connected fitness, uh, digital fitness is like we found yep. that churn is higher, less accountability and, and, and CAC is higher. Um, so, you know, but the one thing I am confident in is the world is ready to get back to some communal based in-person experiences. And Absolutely. that's why stock markets trading live nation at an all time high, despite the fact they haven't sold a concert ticket in a year. So uh, <laughs> right. that's what we're hearing from, Absolutely. From, our, from our folks. And I think, you know, you ask about class pass, like what we do is we give machine learning yield optimization algorithms to gyms, studios, and now spas and salons and pools. We're expanding yeah. beyond just studio fitness. And I think, you know, and then on the consumer side, we kind of machine generate a playlist for you and make it super easy for you to book variety, kind of like DoorDash for, for, for wellness, right? Yeah, uh, it's one app and you get great discounts if you're willing to deal with the trade-offs of booking through ClassPass. You're only getting extra spots. And um, and I think what we've invented for these partners is a form of price discrimination and a really easy right. way for them to fill excess capacity at rev maxing prices. And uh, we can just keep taking that to new verticals. So we're super excited. We've l- built a big corporate business. So now all of you who work for uh, you know a, a company can adopt ClassPass, get your HR team in touch with us. We'll get you subsidized ClassPass. And then the other big push has been adding spa, salon, wellness, beauty type appointments to the platform. So it's not just a fitness uh, experience. It's a holistic wellness sort of system. Right. I love that. Yeah. Especially as just the entire wellness market has this entire surge of new generations behind it. It feels like ClassPass is set up for a lot of success. Um, All right. Well, let's transition to a couple audience questions uh, that we have time for. This one from our friend Abina up in Toronto. Fritz, thanks for the insightful chat. What are three books or resources that have grounded you in your founder journey? That's a really good one. Um, I'll give you two, one book and then one resource. One book was uh, 
Sir Ernest Shackleton, it's, good, it's called Endurance. It's about Sir Ernest Shackleton's 1906 expedition across Antarctica, attempt to become the first person to cross it. And it just, it, it, it reminded me, you know, and I, I'm, I'm sort of aggrandizing the founder journey. It's not as hard as actually taking a dog sled team across Antarctica <laughs> in 1906, but it did remind me of the, the number one determinant of most founders' success in my, in my experience has been resilience and grit. And um, I just took a ton of inspiration from reading about this, 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 this gentleman and, and the team and what they went through, just challenge after challenge and bad set of cards, you know, bad hand after bad hand and how they navigated it. And um, that perseverance, I just find incredibly inspirational and is the single most important trait. I think if you, you know, to, to be a successful entrepreneur, it's never a straight line. All successful yeah. entrepreneurial journeys are series of S curves. You get something working. Great. Then it stops working. Oh shit. It's not going to work. Right. You know, so even Facebook, you know, you zoom out, looks like one big hockey stick. You zoom in and it's like series of uh, things yeah. that they had to figure out. The other one is um, find a good co-founder, whether it's a co-founder in your business or somebody who's building a company that you can rely on. I didn't have a traditional co-founder. But another entrepreneur, a guy named Adrian Ayun, was building a business. He's now the founder of a business called Forward. Um, we became sort of each other's shadow co-founders, so we could tell each other gotcha. the worst things. And unlike most entrepreneurs, you ask, "Oh, how's it going?" "Oh, it's great. My <laughs> metrics are awesome. Like we're gonna, we're right, gonna be a right, right. You know, multi-billion-dollar business." Adrian and I would call each other and be like, "What the fuck are we doing? Like this is the worst thing. Like I don't know how it's looking from your where you're sitting, but from over here, it's right, not right, good." Right. And we could just be really honest. You know, gnarly personnel challenges, difficult um, uh, fundraising moments, or or just decisions. And, and having yeah. somebody be able to bounce that stuff off of is, is not to be underestimated. That could be another founder. It could be a therapist. It could be a partner. Although I'd sort of caution you to about, you know, maybe having another source. There's, there's a lot of stress yeah. on your partner when you go through these things. But those are the awesome. two resources. A, a good inspirational book about perseverance and someone who you can be really raw and honest with who will help you think through. Good, uh, good person to lean on. Tough decision. Awesome. All right. We've got um, one more. Uh, Cade. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. How has uh, ClassPass found the work from home shift? And is it something they plan to carry forward to some degree past the pandemic? This is definitely a hot topic for folks. Yeah, we were lucky in that we were a distributed company, right? So we started in New York, then in San Francisco. Then we opened a big office in Montana. It's now our biggest office. We have an office in Houston, London, Singapore, Sydney. So by being distributed, it, we we're already pretty used to having people on first Google Hangouts, then Zooms. So yep. it, 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 th that muscle gave us an advantage heading into this situation. Um, and we've always been pretty flexible about, hey, if you want to work from home for a few days, that's fine. We do, however, have a strong belief that you do work better if people are together in person. You can't replicate yeah. the sort of whiteboard or the hallway catch-ups or the unintended right. sync-ups or information sharing that, that can happen or just the bonding. So the honest answer, Cade uh, or Kaid, is I don't know. Uh, and we will let people stay remote with manager permission. Some jobs sort of require more in person. Um, we still are really encouraging people to be in the offices in one of our hubs. They can move between them if they want, uh, but we really would try to get people together. And I think most, a lot of us are hungry for that at connection after yep. a year of isolation. But the, if, I was, if I was to be honest, the answer would be, I don't really know. I think right now everyone thinks the world's permanently changed. I think there's some reasonable chance that uh, the world will go back a little bit more like it was with, some added flexibility. So we're, we're anticipating people coming in, you know, to work a few days a week to one of the offices, but staying home, going for a quarter to some other destination, you know, that's fine. We, we, we sort of believe in that flexibility being a recruiting advantage, retention advantage, and also good for helping people do their best work. Sometimes it makes sense to be in person. Sometimes you should be alone. Awesome, Fritz. Well, uh, I'll give you the last word. Any final uh, thoughts or inspiration or wisdom or, or uh, things to plug from your end for the audience before we, uh, before we let you go? No, I think, uh, you know, just if you're going to become an entrepreneur, make sure you're doing it because you, you can't not do it. It's, it's not something you should do for the money or, or for the glory because you know, most of the time that doesn't work out. And even the successful ones like myself have had epic failures. Uh, and, and you gotta be prepared for that. And, um, but you know, the Steve Martin advice, be so good. They can't ignore you. Like ultimately yeah. all that matters is what do you produce? Can you get, build something that users actually love and the rest will sort of take care of itself from there. So with that, thanks awesome. for having me.
Perfect. Thanks so much, Fritz. We appreciate you coming on and uh, hopefully I'll see you out fly fishing on the river sometime soon. Um, Sounds great. We will uh, see you, Fritz. Uh